Greece produces insane quantities of extra virgin olive oil. Greece also produces some of the best ones too. Massive quantity and tons of quality. There are thousands of producers out there that are creating some of the best liquid gold in the world. Here we are lucky to have Malpian Greek, UK's number one Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of Greek products, to get our hands on some of the best extra virgin olive oil outside of Greece. And of course, you lucky listeners, you get a 15% discount from Malbian Greek if you go to their website and uh, put Malbian Greek forward slash delicious when you're shopping. Not only you get fantastic extra virgin olive oil, but you get it in an excellent price too. Malbian Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. The army, with Xerxes, had made its way through Boeotia and burnt the city of the Thespians, who had abandoned it and gone to the Peloponnese and Plataea likewise. Now the army had come to Athens and was devastating everything there. The army burnt Thespia and Plataea upon learning from the Thebans that they had not medized. Since the crossing of the Hellespont, where the barbarians began their journey, They had spent one month there crossing into Europe, and in three more months were in Attica, when Caliades was Archon at Athens. When they took the town, it was deserted, but in the sacred precinct they found a few Athenians, stewards of the sacred precinct and poor people, who defended themselves against the assault by fencing the Acropolis with doors and logs. They had not withdrawn to Salamis, not only because of poverty, but also because they thought they'd discovered the meaning of the oracle the Pythia had given, namely that the wooden wall would be impregnable. They believed that according to the oracle, this, not the ships, was the refuge. The Persians took up a position on the hill opposite the Acropolis, which the Athenians call the Areopagus and besieged them in this way. They wrapped arrows in tar and set them on fire, and then shot them at the barricade. Still the besieged Athenians defended themselves, although they'd come to the utmost danger and their barricade had failed them. When the Pisistratids proposed terms of surrender, they would not listen, but contrived defences such as rolling down boulders onto the barbarians when they came near the gates. For a long time, Xerxes was at a loss, unable to capture them. In time, a way out of their difficulties was revealed to the barbarians, since according to the oracle, all the mainland of Attica had to become subject to the Persians. In front of the Acropolis and behind the gates and the ascent was a place where no one was on guard, since no one thought any man could go up that way. Here, some men climbed up, near the sacred precinct of Kekrop's daughter Aglarus, although the place was a sheer cliff. When the Athenians saw that they had ascended to the Acropolis, some threw themselves off the wall and were killed, and others fled into the chamber. The Persians, who had come up first, turned to the gates, opened them and murdered the suppliants. When they had levelled everything, they plundered the sacred precinct and set fire to the entire Acropolis. So it was that Xerxes took complete possession of Athens and sent a horseman to Susa to announce his present success to Artabanus. On the day after the messenger was sent, he called together the Athenian exiles who accompanied him and asked them to go up to the Acropolis and perform sacrifices in their customary way an order given because he had been inspired by a dream or because he felt remorse after burning the sacred precinct. The Athenian exiles did as they were commanded. I will tell why I have mentioned this. In that Acropolis is a shrine of Erechtheus called the Earthborn, and in the shrine are an olive tree and a pool of salt water. The story among the Athenians is that they were set there by Poseidon and Athena as tokens when they contended for the land. It happened that the olive tree was burnt by the barbarians with the rest of the sacred precinct. 
But on the day after its burning, when the Athenians ordered by the king to sacrifice went up to the sacred precinct, they saw a shoot of about a cubit's length sprung from the stump. And they reported this. My name is Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. On each episode, I find some ancient recipe, ingredient, or tantalizing element from ancient cuisines, which has a fascinating story to tell to our modern selves. Today, we will see some aspects of the extraordinary story of the olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. Never in the history of the world, four words can incite so much confusion and intensely heated conversations. I absolutely adore olive oil. You know me. I am totally in love with this incredible juice that comes from the flesh of olives. I drink the goddamn thing. Today on part one of our extraordinary story of the olive oil, we will see some historical aspects of its production, some myths and ways of making it in ancient Greece and Rome. The history of the olive tree is closely linked with the history of agriculture and of the Mediterranean basin. Indeed, its story begins with the flood itself. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew what the waters were abated from off the earth. Genesis Wherever it came from, the tree was already being cultivated and its fruits pressed to extract their oil 5,000 years ago on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Oil crushers were quite common after the 3rd millennium BCE, although Herodotus says there were no olive trees in Babylonia, so that oil would have had to be imported. The belief that oil conferred strength and youth was long widespread. In ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome, it was infused with flowers and herbs to produce both medicines and cosmetics. Excavations in Mycenae, Greece, revealed a list of aromatics, mint, rose, juniper, sesame, and so on, that were added to the olive oil in the preparation of ointments. In Mesopotamia, the olive has been identified in uh, the cuneiform script as sirdu, and olive oil as something little sirdi. The oil back then, in Mesopotamia, was obtained by soaking the olives in hot water, and the oil which floats to the top is skimmed off or the water drained out through the bottom of the vessel. The fruits and the stones are then pressed. Olive stones have been found in Tel Tayafan, the late 3rd millennium BCE, the Akkadian period, and at Lakshis in Palestine in the 3rd and 1st millennia, and at Nimrud in the Neo-Assyrian period. Olive oil seems to have been used in the northern areas as well of um, the Mesopotamia, what we now call um, Mosul and the Kurdish areas, Um, and references to this as being imported into the Mari region in the second millennium, and olives are listed in the provisions of Asurpanipal's feast at Nimrud. Dealing in olive oil was the backbone of the import-export trade in the ancient world. Great merchants came from such oil-producing countries as Phoenicia, Crete and Egypt, and they spread around the Mediterranean basin and even farther. From the 6th century BCE onwards, the Scythians of the southern steppes of Russia came to stock up with oil at the prosperous Greek trading posts of the Black Sea. Depositories of oil jars, such as those at Como in Crete in in the ancient port of Festos, are evidence of the importance of this trade. The expansion of olive groves and of civilizations that took root around the Greek and Phoenician trading posts went hand in hand. Oil was pressed in Sicily, Italy, North Africa and Catalonia. In Provence, according to Strabo, 
olives were brought to Massalia, now Marseilles, by the Phocaeans, along with the first wine stocks. The vine and the olive tree, says Gaston Rambert, are synonymous with civilization. The Massalians introduced the olive tree to the appreciative Ligurians, who soon anticipated Virgil in discovering that. Olives require no cultivation and have no use for the sickle knife or the stiff tooth rake once they've dug themselves in on the fields and stood up to the winds. Earth herself, by the crooked plough laid bare, provides moisture enough for the plants and a heavy crop from the ploughshare. Thus shall you breed the rich olive, beloved of peace. Solon, the 6th century Athenian legislator, brought in laws to protect and regulate olive groves. If you remember of um, the episode back in January, I believe, about the figs and the fig trees, uh, we saw briefly about Solon and his legislation about fig trees and fig trade out of Athens in the rest of the Mediterranean. So yeah, the same dude also legislated about the protection and the regulation of olive groves in Attica and Athens. So this was on the 6th century BCE. Five centuries later, Caesar issued edicts demanding the annual payment of 3 million litres of oil as tribute from Numidia, the Maghreb of modern times. Tacitus lays much emphasis on oil production. Tunisia, where many olive groves have been planted with the aim of inducing the turbulent nomads to settle down, provided most of the torrent of oil which lubricated the daily diet of the Roman Empire. The Romans recognized only one kind of oil, oleum, from oliva, the olive. Hence the modern word oil and its various European forms. The finest palates preferred oil from Benafro, in the south of the peninsula, or, failing that, oil from Iberia or Dalmatia. So Iberia is modern-day Spain and Dalmatia is Croatia. Any citizen who planted a certain number of acres with olives was excused from military service. Olive oil was liquid gold long before fuel oil came to be described as black gold. The Mediterranean ends, where the olive ceases to grow, said Georges Duhamel, and much the same is true of dietary custom. The idea of Mediterranean cookery immediately evokes the fragrance of olive oil. Jean-Louis Fladren puts it well in his study of diet from the 14th to the 17th century. The dividing line between the areas where olive oil and butter are used for cooking obviously has a natural basis. People cooked with olive oil where olive trees grew, and where there were no olive trees, they resorted to butter. Natural pressures, however, were affected or consolidated by religious regulations. There are many myths that signify the importance of olive oil for the first civilizations of the Mediterranean. 6,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians believed that Isis, the greatest of the goddesses and wife of Osiris, had taught mankind to grow and use olives. The Greeks claimed that honor for Athena Pallas. They saw her as the representative of eternal wisdom, the patron of the science and the arts, springing fully armed from the brain of Zeus. In Rome, the olive tree was sacred to Minerva and Jupiter, the Roman equivalent of Athena and Zeus. It was said that Athens once once ruled by King Cecrops. This ruler, who may have been half man and half snake, helped make Athens so beautiful that it caught the attention of the gods themselves. Each one saw the city and its lands and wanted to become its patron, and it was the source of much discussion and arguments at Olympus. The two stronger contenders were Poseidon and Athena, and so Zeus decided that they should compete against one another by offering gifts to the city and its citizens. Whichever one that Cecrops and the people of the city saw the most value in would determine the winner. Athena and Poseidon descended from Olympus and led a crowd from the city up to the top of Acropolis. It was here that they intended to offer their gifts. Poseidon was the first to present his gift. Raising his mighty trident high into the air, he brought it down hard on the ground, which cracked beneath it. Immediately, a spring of water emerged from the ground, which made the exalted crowd cheer loudly. A good water source was always very important for the ancient Greeks, and the citizens of Athens especially, being in a, in a very dry climate. 
that so they were eager to try it. However, once they tasted the water, they weren't very impressed. It was salty, because Poseidon was the god of the sea, and the water was not good to drink. Then it was Athena's turn. She quietly knelt down and planted something into the ground. Immediately, an olive tree sprang up in its place, which made the crowd cheer loudly. They recognized that the olive tree could provide olives for food and olive oil, and that the leaves might provide shade, and that less productive trees could provide wood to either burn or turn into tools. Athena had certainly proved that she was the goddess of wisdom, and the joyful citizens immediately named the city after her, Athens. And, as Aeschylus put it, the great uh, tragedian of the 4th century BC, Athens and her people could reverse disasters in the vigour of their youth and genius. To be born under an olive tree was a sign of divine ancestry. The nymph Latona bore the twins Artemis and Apollo, the moon and the sun, conceived in her adulterous relationship with Zeus, the lord of Olympus, under an olive tree on the island of Delos, which the kindly Poseidon caused to rise from the waves complete with fields and woods. Romulus and Remus, descended from the gods, and they were also born under an olive tree. According to the Romans, Hercules was charged with spreading the olive as he travelled around the Mediterranean to perform his twelve labours. Of course, all of the above myths are variations of the same old stories about how the olive tree came all over the Mediterranean. Monte Testacchio, the eighth hill of Rome. Wait. What? I'm sure you thought, and you have heard that Rome has only seven hills. Well, technically, this isn't even a hill, and it didn't exist until the second century before our common era. In 1849, Giuseppe Garibaldi, the commander of an Italian gun battery, successfully defended Rome against an attack from the French army at that mount. You see, Romans loved their olive oil. They imported it from all over the Mediterranean world, across the huge Roman Republic, and of course later the Roman Empire, from modern day Spain and Tunisia especially. Romans loved their olive oil, and every time there was a shipment from the city, it was going through the Roman port, and um, obviously it was distributed across the city. But when uh, the amphorae, the ancient uh, vessels, were emptied, they were discarded. And they were all discarded in the same particular spot. That's Monte Testacchio today. This man-made hill, made entirely from 53 million olive oil carrying amphorae, or jars to use me, which were the ancient equivalent of your glass bottles. The numbers are staggering. The hill is 115 feet above today's ground and 45 feet below the modern street level. The broken shards are covering an area of 220,000 square feet, holding 760,000 cubic yards of broken pottery vessels. Centuries passed, and not long after the supposed fall of Rome, this area was abandoned. The man-made pottery hill was grassed over and forgotten. The Romans imported other stuff from across the empire, such as grains and wine, but no other pottery was found in Monte Testacchio. The possible explanation is due to the olive oil residue the sards had could be recycled to make the famous Roman concrete and hence they were simply discarded. Most amphorae used during this time noted the weight, information about where the oil originated, and names of the people who bottled it and weighed the shipment, which is indicative of a stringent inspection system that used to control the trade. The empty weight, as well as the full weight, was recorded, and the names found give an insight into the Roman commercial structure. Many least family business, such as the two Aureli Heracli, father and son, and two Junai, Melissus and Melissa, as well as small groups of men, the partners Hyacinthus, Isidor and Polio, and L. Marius Phoebus and the Vibai, Viator and Retitutus, which were most likely members of joint ventures of skilled freemen. Through olive oil, we can understand so much about the Roman Empire and the ancient trade routes, as well as the commercial history of the ancient world. Amazing, isn't it? The oldest known technique of oil extraction was a stone mortar, spherical or conical, in which olives were crushed by foot. Later on, they were crushed by hand with a pestle, 
Then, the job of crushing was done by a large millstone turning in an open tub into which the olives were tipped whole to come out as, as a paste. Depending on the oil manufacturer's wealth, these crushers were walked by slaves, a mule or a donkey, or even his wife. The Molea Olearia, the Roman oil mill, was of this type. Pictures have been found on murals excavated in North Africa. And also we found some mosaics in Pompeii and other oil mills there. This type of mill was still in use all over the world, um, all over the Mediterranean, and especially in places like Provence until, until a few years, well, until maybe 70, 80 years ago. Now, hopefully not with a wife, but with a donkey. Anyway, <laughs> carrying on. Next, the paste had to be pressed. The most common procedure, which was uh, quite uh, effective, was um, thousands, thousands of years ago, was um, to use some kind of uh, shallow basket made of um, grass or something. And these containers were piled up in stacks of 25 or 50, with a thick layer of olive paste between each of these discs. So the resulting sandwich was then mechanically compressed, and then, um, and then the liquid was collected. There's a fresco in Pompeii that shows a wedge press, and such presses, um, up until a few years ago at least, they still existed in, uh, in, in the Berber countries. During the Olympic Games in ancient Greece, olive wreaths were given to the winners. Since olive trees offered food supplies, agricultural communities were stable as evidenced by the population growth, and as such, societies existed stably for many years. Based on the productive olive orchards, the Greeks and later the Roman Empire developed into great economic forces. Destruction of olive orchards resulted into the decline of these once great establishments. Olive trees and olive oil have engaged the intellect, the senses and the passions of the Greeks for as long as 4,000 years. Olive oil maintained a second place in the Greek religion. Hence, today, in the Greek Orthodox religion, olive oil is used for both baptism and illumination of churches and houses. The sacred lamp that was used in ancient Greece to light houses at night was fueled by olive oil. Furthermore, aged olive oil was used in sacred rituals of the church and at weddings. According to Herodotus, around 500 BC, the growing and the export of olive products was so sacred that olive culture was allowed to be performed only by eunuchs and virgins. Not so sure about the last bit, but that's Herodotus for you. As we've seen, goddess Athena's gift of the olive, which was useful for food, medicine, perfume and fuel, was considered to be a more useful gift than Poseidon's. The legend has it, obviously, that Athena, the goddess Athena planted the original olive tree in the Acropolis, in Athens. Thus, this location is supposed to be the first location that the olive tree grew. And, of course, according to Greek mythology, this original olive tree was in existence at the ancient sacred site, and all the Greek olive orchards originated from the leafy cuttings of this original tree. It was forbidden to cut down that uh, sacred tree, and the penalty for, uh, for anyone who, who did it, it was execution. Uh, living mythology aside for a little bit, the first plantings and hand harvesting of olive trees in Greece, in, uh, in what we consider now Greece, dates back to 3500 BC during the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete. Alongside the Minoans, who traded olive oil across uh, to Egypt mainly, the Phoenicians spread the olive tree to the Mediterranean shores of Africa and southern Europe, Spain mainly. Olive cultivation expanded to southern Italy Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia. Olives have been found in Egyptian tombs dating from 2000 BC. Much later, the Roman emperors protected olive cultivation by law, and today's countries of Morocco, Spain, Tunisia, and Italy were the most important sources of olive oil for the Roman Empire. The same protection of olive trees was provided by the emperors of the Byzantium, as well as by the Arabs. Olive oil, the sacred Extra virgin olive oil, the liquid cold, was never, never a cheap product. It was very labor intensive. And hence, there were always stories of uh, adulteration of olive oil. Later, much later, in the 15th century, there was always a considerable risk in London, Paris, or Bruges of encountering blends with nothing virgin about them but their name. Uh, this olive, these supposed olive oils, 
who could have been described as frying oils. Um, but uh, they were the kind of oils that um, were extracted uh, from the oil cake or even from poppy seeds. And um, they were blended with old uh, stale oil and it was very christened as uh, extra virgin. And obviously that's what a lot of uh, northern northern Europeans, kings and queens and so on, and um, aristocracy had, which meant um, uh, basically it was disgusting and it wasn't tasty at all. And um, there is an English saying at the time of the Hundred Years' War, as brown as oil. So this oil from the olive oil cake used in London and probably came straight from Languedoc region in France in goldskin bottles. And I bet that made the smell of, uh, of the bad oil even, even stronger. An English traveller in the time of Henry IV of France, Thomas Platter, claims to have heard in Montpellier that this oil from the third pressing was expressly intended for export. So the natives of the area, the locals, uh, kept uh, the best oil for themselves and no doubt enjoyed it. But the English got um, the worst one for their cooking. Partly this, um, this kind of behaviour stands um, as, um, as an example of the dis- distrust of the of the English for the oil. Expensive and difficult to produce, yes, but it was never, never not used uh, generously. <laughs> Any traditional Mediterranean cuisine and in ancient uh, cookery also. It served several purposes uh, in food. It was a medium for marinating meat and fish before cooking. It was also a cooking medium, of course. It was used as a dressing for both cooked food when served and for fresh green vegetables. For this purpose, it was sometimes used alone, sometimes mixed with vinegar and aromatic herbs. Finally, it was used as it was used in conserving. Olive oil is one of the best cooking oils, since apart from its unusual health benefits, it retains good flavor and its boiling point is high. In ancient times, it had no competition from cheaper vegetable oils. While in ancient Mediterranean cuisine, animal fat was not used as a cooking medium. Wherever the Roman army went, olive oil was needed, and its manufacture and use spread widely under the Roman Empire. As the principal vegetable oil of the ancient Mediterranean, olive oil had many non-food uses as well. It was a fuel, especially for lamps. It was a soap or cosmetic. It was used for rubbing on the body, and it was used for oiling clothes. Perfumed oils used for burning and as unguents and were made with the addition of various spices and aromatics. At Abydos, in ancient Upper Egypt, jars of scented oils and unguents appear in a pre-dynastic tomb. The Cretans exported large quantities of oil to Egypt, where it was used to make all the above mentioned here. The Egyptians also started producing their own oil by the Middle Kingdom. Greece produces insane quantities of extra virgin olive oil, Greece also produces some of the best ones too. Massive quantity and tons of quality, and Greeks eat it as if it's going out of fashion. Gallons and gallons per family per year. There are thousands of producers out there that are creating some of the best liquid gold in the world. Here we are lucky to have Malpian Greek, UK's number one Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of Greek products, to get our hands on some of the best extra virgin olive oil outside of Greece. If you're looking for quantity and quality, you won't be disappointed with Chris of Pigis' 5-litre can of olive oil from Eastern Crete in Citia, a classic, robust Cretan olive oil full of substance that doesn't shout out loud from the top of the mountains its qualities. But once you try it, you won't regret it. Low acidity, harmony and balance is what Cretan olive oil is all about. Also from the arid and sparsely vegetated Eastern Crete again, in Lassithi, we have another great Cretan olive oil, which is called Charisma, with subtle fruity aromas and a full-on rich flavor with a hint of pungency and pepperiness. The olives are harvested when fully ripe and hence give an almost buttery olive oil. Mitira, from the beautiful island of the northeastern Aegean Sea, Lesbos, is another great extra virgin olive oil at Malbin Greek. The grassy and fresh aromas of the olive oil are in perfect harmony with its rich taste. Perfect for salads, of course, but also for cooking the famous Greek ladera dishes. Finally, the standout extra virgin olive oil from Malbin Greek, it's their own one, 
made in the hard and unforgiving Mani Peninsula in the Peloponnese, where once Patrick Lee Fermor lived for decades. This olive oil is an early harvest one, meaning that the olives are picked when they're still green. This olive oil is so packed with health benefits, you want to drink it in a glass. Full aroma of green tomatoes and freshness, big strong flavor with a pungency that hits at the back of your throat and stays for a few seconds. And a pronounced bitter sensation. This is what olive oil is all about. Use it raw, straight in your salads, roasted veg or grilled fish and octopus. You will feel invigorated and young again. And of course, you lucky listeners, you get a 15% discount from Malbin Creek if you go to their website and uh, put Malbin Creek forward slash delicious when you're shopping. You, not only you get fantastic extra virgin olive oil, but you get it in an excellent price too. Malbian Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. What do we know about its production and the different kinds of olive oil? We know that green olive oil, Oleum Viride, was made in Roman Italy from underripe olives. Instructions are given by Palladius for making it in October. The best was reputed to come from Cassinum in southern Latium. This was a good gastronomic choice for use as a dressing, as we are informed by Cato, Suetonius and Palladius. The oil of unripe olives, uh, in ancient Greek omphakion, was used as a vehicle for perfumes. The same Greek and Latin term was used for verjuice. The oil of the wild olive, thin and bitter, was used in medicines. Greek amorge, and Latin amurca, is the bitter, watery liquid that separates from olive oil in the pressing. It is inedible, but had many uses in traditional agriculture. The Roman writer Columella has some instructions uh, on olive oil production, and um, of course, more details about olives. He enumerates 10 varieties of olives, and this number may be considerably increased from the works of other ancient writers. So the following seem to be the most important. Pausia, Posea, Regia, Orchis, Orchitis, Orchita, Orcas, Radius, Licinis, Liciniana, Sergia, Sergiana. Of these, the Posia, according to Columella, obviously always, was the most pleasant in flavor. Although upon this point he apparently contradicted by Virgil. The Regia was the handsomest in appearance, while both of these together with the Orchis and the Radius and in general, all the larger varieties were better suited for eating than oil. The Licinia, on the other hand, yielded the finest oil, the Sergia the greatest quantity. Here is an excerpt from Columella, an innovator of his time and ours, from the 50th chapter of his 12th book. With the harvesting of the olive, there are some precautions that must be taken to have it in the mill, and how to extract different kinds of oil. The most proportionate time for the olive harvest is normally at the beginning of December, If you do it well before this time, the oil is acidic. Around these months, the green oil is extracted, but it is of the greatest utility to extract the green, not only because it leaves a lot, but also because with its heat, it almost doubles the income of the owner. The fruit that is taken every day is crushed and pressed instantly. The millstones are easier to handle, and they can also be lowered or raised according to the magnitude of the olives so as not to break the bone that would alter the taste of the oil. Since the olives begin to vary in color, and there are already some blacks among the many white ones, it is convenient to take them by hand on a serene day, and with interwoven wattles or reeds that will extend under the trees, they are to be sifted and cleaned. After they are cleaned, in a careful fashion, they will be taken immediately to the mill. They will be put entirely in new baskets and put under the press where they will be squeezed promptly and for a short time. You must have three rows of piles in the oil mill. To throw in the first, the oil of first quality, that is, that of the first pressing. In the second, that of the second, and in the third, that of the third. It is of the utmost importance not to mix that of the second pressing, and much less that of the third, with that of the first because the one that comes out pure with the littlest effort of the press makes an oil that is of much better taste than the others. You obtain a lot more money from the high price of the green oil than from the great abundance of the bad oil. 
We see here a distinction is made by columella between the oil obtained by the fruit when it's green, when it's half ripe, and when it's fully ripe. And while he considers the manufacture of the first as an inexpedient, in consequence of the, of the scanty produce, he strongly recommends the proprietor to make as much as possible on the, of the second, because the quantity yielded was considerable and the price so high as almost to double his income. What we know about uh, oil making as well uh, from evidence and from other writers and from archaeological uh, excavations is that um, the fruit of the olive tree consists of two parts, the pulpy pericarp, caro, and the stone, nucleus. So under ordinary circumstances, the ripe fruit, uh, when gathered, was carefully cleaned and then conveyed in baskets to the farmhouse where it was placed in heaps upon sloping wooden floors, in order that a portion of the amurka might flow out and a slightly fermentation takes place, which rendered them more tender and more productive. And exactly the same system is pursued for the same reason in modern times. The gatherings of each day were kept separate and great care was taken to leave them in this state for a very limited period. For if the masses heated, the oil soon became rancid. If, therefore, circumstances did not allow of the oil being made soon after the fruit was gathered, the olives were spread out and exposed to the air so as to check any tendency towards decomposition. Although both ancient and modern experience are upon the whole in favour of a slight fermentation, Cato, whose great practical knowledge entitles him to respect, Cato strongly recommends that it should be altogether dispensed with, and affirms that oil would be both more abundant in quantity and superior in quality. Afterwards, the olives, when considered to be in a proper state, were placed in bags or flexible baskets, and were then subjected to the action of the machine consisting partly of a bruising and partly of squeezing apparatus, which was constructed in various ways, and designated by various names, trapetium, mola olearia, canalis esolea, torcular, prelum, tuticula. The oil, as it was coming out, was received in a leaden pot, placed in the cistern below the press. From the cortina, it was ladled out by an assistant with a large flat spoon, first into one vat and then to another, 30 being placed in a row for this purpose. It was allowed to rest for a while in each, and the operation was repeated again and again, until the amurka and all the impurities have been completely removed. In cold weather, where the oil remained in union with the amurka, the separation was affected by mixing a little salt with the combined fluids. But when the cold was very intense, dry carbonate of soda was found to work better. The oil was finally poured into jars, which had been previously thoroughly cleaned and seasoned and glazed with a wax or gum to prevent absorption. And the lids were carefully secured and they were then delivered to the overseer by whom they were stored up in a vault reserved for their reception. After a moderate force has been applied to the press, the considerable quantity of oil had been flown forth, the bruised cake, which was called samsa, was taken out of the bags, mixed with a little salt, and placed and subjected to the action of the press a second and a third time. The oil first obtained was the finest and the proportion as additional force was applied by the pressmen, the quality became gradually worse. Hence, the product of each pressing was kept separate and the market value of each being very different. The lowest quality of all was made from olives which have been partially damaged by vermin or which have fallen from the trees in bad weather into the mud. So it became necessary to wash them in warm water before they would be used. The quantity of fruit thrown at one time into the press varied from 120 to 160 modi according to the capacity of the vessels. This quantity was termed factus. The amount of oil obtained from one factus was called hostus, but these are not the only words or terms that have been used. The Romans knew the product well enough to develop techniques that remained almost unchanged until 900. The pressing of the olives was done by means of the trapetium, a sort of large mortar, or by means of the mola olearia a stone wheel with an adjustable base so not to entirely crush the kernel of olives. The olive paste obtained by crushing was placed inside a torcular, a press which was powered by a lever, winch or screw, and damed to extract the juice. The oil, mixed to vegetation water, was then conveyed into a clay container and then poured into a larger container where exploiting the rising of the olive oil to the surface, it became possible to eliminate the sludge. 
The oil that was obtained could differ in quality, and depending on this difference, its value and use changed. Of course, there were plenty of uh, olive oil byproducts. One called amburka. The leftover water from the milling process, which is called amburka in Latin and amorgi in Greek, and it's a watery, bitter tasting, smelly liquid residue. This liquid was collected from central depression in the Sentlik vats. Amurka, which had and has a bitter taste and an even worse smell, was discarded along with the dregs. Then, and today, Amurka is a serious pollutant with a high mineral salt content, low pH and the presence of phenols. However, in the Roman period, it was said to have had several uses. When spread on surfaces, uh, Amurka forms a hard finish. When boiled, it can be used to grease axles, belts, shoes and hides. It is edible by animals and was used to treat malnutrition in livestock. It was prescribed to treat wounds, ulcers, dropsy, erysipelas, gout and chillblains. According to some ancient texts, it was also used in moderate amounts as a fertilizer or pesticide, repressing insects, weeds and even voles. Amurka was also used to make plaster, particularly applied to the floors of granaries, where it hardened and kept out mud and some pests. It was also used to seal olive jars, improving the burning of firewood, and added to laundry could help protect clothing from moths. According to new archaeological research, the people of Palestine produced olive oil in the region as far back as 8,000 years ago. In a dig at the site of the Bronze Age town of Ain Zippori, just over a mile west of Nazareth, researchers unearthed shards of broken pottery containers. According to live science, chemical analysis of the pottery shards revealed the traces of ancient olive oil. To make sure that the ancient vessels once held olive oil, the researchers compared the chemical residues left on the ancient clay of a modern-day clay sample with one-year-old olive oil inside. The analysis of the two were remarkably similar, they found. Of the nearly two dozen pottery containers found at the site, two dated to around 5800 BCE. So according to the researchers, in their study, the find pushes back by several centuries the onset of olive oil production. Finding olive oil in ceramic containers, together with the finds from Kfar Samir, uh, teaches us that the storage of vegetable oil, and especially olive oil, it was a regular custom and had a major role in the diet of the of the population in the area. According to the Times of Israel, the find may mark the earliest known case of olive oil production in the Mediterranean basin. The importance of olive oil can be seen from about 4,000 years ago and uh, how central was to the economy of, of, of the region. So about uh, a few years ago, in a grove of ancient olive trees in the southwest Cyprus, archaeologists discovered the scene of a catastrophe. A large workshop has been destroyed by a powerful earthquake around 1800 BCE. And as, obviously, <laughs> our prime example, Pompey, time had stopped. So the archaeological excavations uh, discovered that every object was left just where the terror-stricken workers have left it. And we have distilling equipment and maceration dishes containing essences of lavender, coriander, laurel, and rosemary. We have smelting furnaces that still had traces of copper and bronze of the kind used to make statues and also looms for weaving linen and wool fabrics. And at the center of this complex, archaeologists unearthed grindstones and a massive press for making olive oil, along with 12 enormous pithy capable of holding a total of 3,000 liters of olive oil. The significance of, of the mill, of the olive oil mill, at the heart, at the center of this uh, seemingly haphazard agglomeration of industries, gradually dawned on the excavators. Olive oil, they saw, was the common denominator for the entire complex. It was the solvent and base for perfume making, the hot burning fuel for the smelting furnaces, the fabric softener and lubricant for the looms in the textile mill. Workers in the mill also decanted olive oil into terracotta urns and sold it to local people, who would use it as food, skin lotion, medicine and lamp fuel. Worshippers 
in a triangular temple on the site even offered sacrifices of oil on a high stone altar to a mysterious god embodied as the skull of a bull with curving stone horns. Olive oil was the greatest renewable energy source in antiquity, which burned as hot as benzene and had twice the caloric content of carbon. At the side of Pyrgos, in Cyprus, we find it playing a central role in a number of industries, including three, the perfumes, textiles and metallurgy, which were the central pillars of the Cypriot economy and the main goods and the main goods for long distance trade by the shipping routes of the ancient world. No wonder olive oil was considered sacred from the earliest times, together with the tree that produced it. We can go even further in the past, and we have hints of the first human uses of the of the olive, back to Paleolithic and Neolithic uh, Mediterranean, mysterious 7,000-year-old petroglyphs in the barren Ahagar Mountains, deep in the Sahara, show dancing men with crowns of olive leaves, showing the importance of olives at the time when a, a milder climate permitted them to grow in Sahara. These people gathered wild olives for food and at some point began to press them for oil. Or perhaps uh, the reverse is true. Some scholars Uh, noting the extreme bitterness of the uncured olives, suggested that people first made oil for the use as skin lotion and only later started eating it. So, yeah, we will never know, I suppose, which came first, the use of the olive oil or the eating of the olive. By the late Bronze Age, olive trees were being cultivated systematically in the Eastern Mediterranean and oil has been extracted from their fruit with large presses sometimes operated by several people at once. At Ekron in Palestine, a 2,800-year-old olive mill was found, with a battery of 100 massive presses, which used logs for liver arms and were capable of producing about half a million litres a year. In the 3rd millennium BC, earnings from the sale of olive oil were already the lifeblood of several Mediterranean economies. Olive oil was an important part of the king's treasury in Ebla, Mari, Ugarit, and Minoan Crete, where it was stored in huge quantities in earthenware jars in their royal cellars. Cuneiform tablets in Ebla and Mycenaean Greek Linear B writings in Crete describe broad olive plantations, large-scale mills, and an extensive trade in oil with the peoples throughout the Mediterranean. Olive oil helped not only to fund the rise of these civilizations, but to preserve their histories as well. So during the natural disasters and invasions and um, all, uh, all this that uh, brought um, the Bronze Age to an abrupt end, the highly flammable oil, which was stocked beneath the royal palaces, caught fire and um, uh, the, the clay tablets were baked and the clay tablets which were used for archiving purposes, with all the writings for archiving purposes, were hardened, baked and survived to our age. So they can be discovered by archaeologists. By the Middle Kingdom, the Egyptians were producing their own oil and olive um, trees had become an important motif in the Egyptian art and amphorae of oil were common grave good. The tomb of Tutankhamun was uh, amply supplied with olive oil. For the Egyptians, the clear, strong light of burning oil had the sacred resonance. In a papyrus from about 1000 BC, the pharaoh Ramses II expresses his devotion to the sun god Ra. I made olive groves in your city of Heliopolis, supplied with gardeners and numerous workers charged with extracting pure Egyptian oil of the first quality, to keep alive the lamps in your sumptuous holy palace. In this life and the next life, olive oil was a sacred substance. And somewhere here, we finish in with our first part of the history of olive oil. And next time we'll see a few more uh, modern elements of uh, olive oil. And um, we'll talk about um, taste and um, quality and some interesting recipes uh, using olive oil for preserving or cooking. Thank you for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thanks to my actors that uh, performed some lovely parts. So thanks to Jonathan Kidd, Tony Hurst and Mark Knight for helping me in this episode. And thanks to all my patrons for their support all this time. 
And um, yeah, see you soon. Until next time. Bye.